Thank you, and, and um, this session has, has been great so far, and I was really excited after the, the first three things. The music was inspirational, um, and then I got to realize that I have got my own story of Janoon to tell you, and really great, and then it's about embracing uncertainty, and now I'm about to give you a, a PowerPoint with no dance. <laughs> so I sort of feel let down somewhat by that. So as a kid, I dreamt about working with NASA. I dreamt about going to space, about being an astronaut. And I became a material scientist and an engineer. And I eventually ended up working on this. I actually held things that are on Mars now. And a decade ago, I went to work. And I held the circuit boards that are inside of the, uh, of the panoramic camera up here. And the magnetic standards for the MOS power spectrometer that's on the end of this arm. And the lithium ion batteries that are buried inside this chassis uh, I worked on. It was really, really exciting work. I felt like I was living a dream. This is where I went to work, the Jet Propulsion Lab. It's nestled in the beautiful Southern California mountains. My office was right next to them. I took walks and bike rides every day. I was incredibly happy. And I couldn't imagine much else. Of course, now I get up <laughs> under the cold, cold Pittsburgh skies. I ride my bike to work. It's cold and windy. And this is what I see when I walk inside, buckets of black dirt and soot. And I am more excited now to work with these people who are looking at food processing that spits out funny looking intermediate products. We get stuff on our face. There's bigger accidents sometimes. And I will go through part of a day looking like this because no one tells me. It's a joke. <laughs> I don't even know. And after all of this, though, I will tell you, this is the most exciting work I've ever done. I'm so inspired by it. And it makes me uh, so happy that I made the decision to come and sort of take a leap of faith and leave what was my dream job. And so this is the story of what that job is and, and how it happened. And so when I came to CMU, uh, I was an energy technologist. And uh, among all the things that we do as energy people is try to put our work in context. And the biggest context you can imagine is how much energy does the world need? And this is a plot of energy consumption as a function of the year, right? And this is a, a petawatt hour. It's 10 to the 15th watt hours, which is a huge number. It's so big I can't understand it. I can't explain it. Uh, but I'll put it in some context. Uh, in 1990, the world used about 100 petawatt hours, OK? Some people use quadrillion BTUs, which is equally silly. It should just be big number. And as we go 10 years later, we've about 10% more and another 15% more by 2008. And it keeps on going and going and going. And so by 2035, it's predicted, using pretty good models, I think, that we're going to need a huge amount of energy, over twice what we used in, 2000, or in 1990. Uh, and which is, something else that's very interesting is you look, most of the increase is actually occurring in developing countries. Uh, there are more people there. They're growing faster. And they all want access to energy. And that will make them healthier and happier people. And so one of the challenges that we have is trying to grow as much of this energy as we can using renewable energy sources, right? And that doesn't look like it's too bad. That's about a quarter or a fifth of the overall need in 2035. It's a long time from now. Surely we can do that. We're working on it. There's people doing it, right? Um, and it doesn't seem too bad until you consider what's happening right now. But by 2015, we're going to have, and the actual number is actually much smaller, we're not going to have uh, an, even, even a fraction of what we need. And so the real message here is that uh, you know, we don't have enough. And Bill Gates, about two years ago, he had his single wish. If he could have any single wish, it would be uh, to have energy half the cost uh, with no CO2 by 2050. And so the goal then is to just to come close to that by 2035. Can we get even closer, uh, maybe even not imagine doing what he wants, because it's a huge, I mean, that's almost impossible if you think about it. But maybe we could do this, right? 20 to 40 petawatt hours per year, additional renewable energy. Uh, and it's got to be cost competitive, at least. Maybe not half the price, but cost competitive. And we are so far from behind just from getting to that point, right? And what I want to talk to you about is one of the main reasons why we're behind. It's because renewable energy, solar power, for example, is inherently intermittent, right? This is a plot of time on the x-axis and power that comes out of the solar array, right? And the sun comes up, it goes up, good power. Sun goes down, no power, right, all night. Then it happens again. And some days there's clouds, right? And cloud cover makes it even more intermittent, right? And if you can't make this continuous, you can't have what's called base load power, right? It's not going to be coming at a constant time. People can't always rely on it. 
So we need some kind of magical device that turns <laughs> that into that, right? So what is it, right? It's easy to imagine. It's a freaking battery, right? It's energy storage, right? It's not a new idea. Energy storage has existed for you know, centuries, right? People, you pump water up a hill, right? And you store it in a reservoir, and then you run it through a turbine. This is called pumped hydro energy storage. It's ubiquitous, but we've basically used up all the locations that make sense for pumped hydro, right? There's lithium ion batteries for our computers and cars a little bit. There's uh, you know, all kinds of other batteries, but unfortunately, we need a lot of batteries to do 40 petawatt hours of energy. Uh, and in fact, another thing from, Ted, uh, from uh, Bill Gates' talk two years ago, all the batteries on Earth, 10 minutes of storage only. It's not enough. We need multiple hours at least, maybe 10 or 20 hours to even make a dent at coming close to this, at using renewable energy. So this is sort of where I decided, well, we kind of got solar power and renewable power sources. We don't have the batteries. So I, I want to try and make a difference here, right? And so one of the other things I teach at CMU is innovation theory. And it turns out that unlike information technology where you have uh, an idea and a case of Red Bull and the internet, <laughs> kids can make a website that makes money almost immediately. Their average number of years to market is less than one. But for things like batteries or energy storage systems that are somewhere between medium and high complexity, you're looking at something between eight and 10 years historically, right? These are for materials-based innovations where you have an idea to market, right? And you know, low is like hula hoops and buckets, and high is like, uh, very high is like space shuttles, right? So somewhere in the middle is this. And that's too long, right? You can't, if we have 20 years to get to this huge number of desired renewable integration, we have to be able to innovate more quickly. Uh, so assembly instructions, right? Step one, put it together. Step two, there's a chair. Right? <laughs> what does this look like for batteries, right? Step one, make the battery. Step two, there it is, right? So I think, how do I make this work? What's this look like, right? So the first rule is to imagine what do I have to work with, right? You can't imagine having, if it's such a big project, you have to start with really, really common things, right? So step one of this is only work with this stuff. This is one of my favorite data sets. It's the abundance of materials that we have access to on the surface of the Earth, right? And we have way more of these things than we have of these things. So use this, right? And then, then you have to figure out, well, I gotta put it together and make something that's gonna work and it's gotta be different and it have to, has to be new enough that someone will fund it and it will make money for them and hopefully change the world, right? So, uh, and it's gotta look like this. You have to have a, you, you, if you can't think about in terms of like mounds of stuff in, in huge sacks, and this is a salt flat, that's a manganese ore mine. If you're not getting your stuff from here, and if you can't change it just a little bit and use it for your device, you're not gonna get there in 10 years. So this is now sort of the meat of the innovation story that I have. This is how it happens, right? This is my menu of options, right? Somehow, in this mix of crap, I gotta figure out how to make a good battery that's gonna last 20 years and change the world. So I got this stuff, this is all you got. No, seriously, if you can't do it with this, you're, not, you're gonna fail, because it's, it's too expensive. You gotta be cost effective, right? So it's pretty simple then. You gotta select the materials, and this is where being a PhD in material science, electric chemistry is somewhat helpful. Um, <laughs> you, uh, you select the materials. Is it gonna be cheap enough? If it's not, go back, select different materials, right? So that's kind of where that list goes. Then you have to define the purity requirements. So it's not just what materials, but if I have to really purify something, purification costs a lot of money. So you have to get through that cost gate. And then you have to figure out if you can actually manufacture the materials. You have to assess the manufacturability. All this is happening on paper, basically. This is sort of the thought experiment that you go through initially. Uh, and then if it passes that, then maybe you can make some little test devices and assess whether or not the performance is gonna be good enough. And the performance really is defined by these three things. Uh, cost, right, per unit energy stored. Is it safe and is it reliable? And this, the degree of safety and reliability are also defined by who's gonna be using, in this case, the world, who wants to use more renewables. So this is how sort of it starts, right? You have to think about this and go through this process and, and will it work or not? And after a little bit of thinking, and this is sort of what came out of it. It's a really simple idea. It's a, it's a, it's a sodium ion battery. It has water, salt water, sodium sulfate. It's a preservative as the electrolyte. And you've got carbon as the anode. That's the minus sign. Uh, and manganese oxide as a cathode, 
and the sodium dissociates with this. It goes between the two. So when you charge the battery, all the sodium goes over to the carbon side. It lives there happily when it's charged. And when it's discharged, the sodium goes back. And the electrons go on the outside, and that should be some current. So true story, though. One of the things that's a big cost driver in a lot of uh, batteries is the separator, this white thing in between that separates the two. And I had done a lot of testing, this was 2008, and I thought, man, it should work. But everything, everything I was trying wasn't working. And I finally got it to work with Teflon. Teflon, way too expensive. It'll never work, right? So like, I've got to find something that's going to work that's going to be cheap. And I was going through a freshman chemistry book, and there's this picture of a salt bridge with a cotton ball in the middle. And I was like, and this happened. This, this is a true story. It's the actual t-shirt. Uh, that day, I took off the t-shirt on my very back and punched a hole in it and put it in the very first test picture that worked. Uh, I subsequently used this same shirt for the next six months. <laughs> this is all that's left of that shirt. And I, I propose to you this shirt has the highest return on investment of any t-shirt <laughs> in the history of mankind. I rose two rounds of funding from major venture capitalists <laughs> from devices made from this t-shirt. True story. Uh, of course, we use a synthetic cotton now, but it's the same idea. It's a, it's a ubiquitous, cheap, sort of easily available material. So I'll put that in cotton, right? <laughs> Makes me happy. So the next step, so that's the idea. And then you have to actually make it real. You have to prove it, right? This is what I call the proof phase. And so you have to prove the materials. Now, that was what I just showed you. It was the very first proof, right? And then you have to go get funding, maybe, because that's, that's the other thing. It's not, I mean, it's, it's great to have the notion and the desire to change the will, and, and, but to do it, you have to have funding to make it work. So every, as you think about this, as you go to make it from an idea to a reality, you have to have very concise ideas of what is going to get you the funding that you need to make it work, right? What are the pass-fail criteria? So then you prove a device, and the device is different than materials. A device is something that actually could be put out in the world and make a difference. You don't have to build actually the whole thing, but you have to prove the critical aspects of that device that will make it happen. And you get more funding, maybe, right? Depending if you need it. Prove manufacturing. You get to prove that you could actually manufacture that device in a way that's cost effective. And you might get more. And each one of these steps is a potential time when you go ask for more support because everything is more complicated and more difficult. And then you prove the prototype, which is what I just spent about a year and a half doing, which is when you build something that's actually legitimately uh, a, a manufactured or proto-manufactured device that could go out in the world and, and make a difference, right? And then for sure, you need funding to get to the next step, which is manufacturing, building a factory that's going to make hundreds or thousands of megawatt hours a year of storage that's going to allow these renewables to be used, right? So going through this process in the past year and a half, I've learned a huge amount. Uh, and that's sort of the rules here, right? Um, and, and this is focused explicitly about how do I do this quickly? How do I beat that 10 to 12 year limit that almost everyone comes up against when they're trying to innovate with materials? Um, and you, the key is to focus on every individual step and not beyond that, right? You have to clearly define the pass-fail criteria every time. You can't look and beyond. You can't get distracted. You don't have to over-resolve anything. Um, do, don't discuss. I was in many meetings where people were discussing things. Is this going to happen? Is this real or not? Whatever. I would leave the meeting and go do the experiment that would solve the question they were discussing before they could finish talking about it. <laughs> right? Don't talk. Just get out there and make it work. And never over-resolve your needs. Right? If you over-resolve anything, you're wasting time and money. Do things to the minimum necessary resolution to get you to the next step. What do the people who are giving you money need to see? They need to see fancy PowerPoints that give them a false sense of resolution. <laughs> That's what they need to see, right? So what you need to do is generate that false sense of resolution with the minimum amount of information, right? That's the key. Of course, they're going to watch this video now and be going to think that I duped them, but they didn't. It's real. And only do the necessary work to prove yourself. So, I mean, I, I, guess, I guess I get the message home, right? So what I'm about to show you then is just sort of a, a series of pictures of the evolution of the device that, that's happened very quickly, right? It starts out with something really ugly. In fact, it's a failed experiment. There's, there's no t-shirt in it yet. The stuff has fallen off. It's a mess. A little bit more you know, elegant beaker, right? And then a coin. So a true story, the best way to do this, you close it in with wires wrapped around it. That's the fastest way to make good contact with the test fixture. So for a while, we had like hundreds of clothespin hanging uh, test devices. Great data, though. And then a little more professional looking stainless steel thing. And then it turns into a bunch of Franken batteries, things that are like messy, goopy, full of epoxy. They're ugly. Uh, this is one of the first larger ones that we made. It didn't work. This was a disaster. 
Uh, this is the famous half epoxy, half real battery. It didn't work. Uh, this one kind of worked OK. Really terrible battery. Uh, OK, OK. Oh, no, don't, don't use that one. It's really bad. That's a particularly bad one. Uh, and then it starts to get more, looking a bit more elegant, sort of well fat manufactured, uh, sort of put together, sort of a bigger one. And this is actually one from, we actually designed and had injection molded casing and really built this on an assembly line. And we make a lot of these now, uh, many kilowatt hours a day if we want. And then we actually put some together and we tested them and then we were able to actually ship them to customers, right? So this is our first ship day. We're all pretty happy. Uh, they're on pallets. Each one of these is about, uh, I don't know, four to five kilowatt hours. We're pretty happy about that. Uh, and this was sort of a part of the celebration. We, we sent all this out and they went uh, to Australia, right? And now they're on test. And this, this is uh, in late 2011. So uh, an idea to first scaled factory in 3.5 years. So we're way ahead of, of a 10 year target. And the idea is to you know, do what I just described. And so that's the story.